Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. Today we are going to be taking a look at the final prices from the September 2019 Rock Island Premier Auction. And we'll start with the one that just kind of went bonkers, and that is the Norinco 313. This is the light machine gun version, semi-auto light machine gun version of the uh, Chinese Type 81. And this thing went for a kind of mind-boggling $37,000, which I think is largely due to the fact that there are basically none of these in the U.S. There's just a handful of semi-auto ones that came in uh, before the, the ban in the late 80s. There are, as far as I know, like none of the machine guns. There are some that have been uh, brought in commercially into Canada, uh, but those are illegal to bring into the U.S. and they don't have the light machine gun version. And you put all that together and there are some people out there willing to spend really, really big money on stuff like that. Kind of at the other end of the spectrum, uh, we have this, which I thought was a very historically uh, relevant and interesting gun that was actually at the James part of the Jameson raid, uh, and to me, fifty five hundred for this is kind of about where I would expect it. Um, it's a very rare version of the rifle, uh, one that the British generally retrofitted or, or updated into new models, and it's got the really cool provenance of the Jameson raid. The Lee Navy here for four grand, on the other hand, I think went higher than it should have. Um, there were several Lee Navies in this auction, and this one. Uh, was substantially pricier than the other two. Maybe there's a particular reason for that that I didn't pick up on, but to my mind, uh, seller got a really good deal on that one, uh, shall we say. Now, taking a look at the next guy, this I think definitely went higher than, well, higher than I would have paid for it. Uh, $3,100 for a Walther KKW. You know, we actually have a lot of these German training rifles in the US. A lot of them came back as souvenirs and trophies with U.S. soldiers, and so to my mind, that's that's more than I would have paid for this rifle. But on the other hand, it was a pretty nice example of one, um, and so you never know what can happen at auctions. We have a similar, actually identical price, the exact same bid level, uh, on this, which I wasn't able to determine if this was a, a legitimate military rifle or if it was a gun put together. Uh, the Martini Henry community tends to come down on the side of put together, but clearly someone uh, decided that they thought it was legitimate enough to drop three grand on. So hopefully they enjoy that rifle. Exact same price again. We have an 1871 Spencer conversion. These are neat in that they were originally carbines that were converted into long rifles um, by the U.S. Arsenal after the war. You can see that it still has the carbine sling ring on it there. There are a lot of different variations of Spencers. They're cool. They have a neat historical place as one of the most common early U.S. repeating rifles. So uh, this was the first time I'd run into one of these, and not surprisingly, there aren't very many of them out there. Uh, one of the very first pistols purchased by the United States military, and this is one of those things that you would kind of expect. You know, it's early. It's got historical significance. It's American military. That's rare. $63,000. Uh, they actually had one of the French pistols that this was based on that went for like 2800 so huge difference there. Um, the Freeman is kind of one of a large number of Civil War, you know, um, secondary revolvers and went for pretty much a Civil War secondary revolver price. They all kind of fall into this this sort of realm when they're in decent condition and they're relatively scarce guns. You know, there were a lot of contractors that made things like this in relatively small numbers. So now uh, moving on to some dragoons. I went through a whole bunch of dragoons. We'll start with this one, the top one in the picture. You'll notice it actually has the rear sight out on the barrel instead of being a notch cut in the hammer. This is the long barreled version, eight inch instead of seven and a half, brought $6,300. So uh, dragoons are not the most popular of Colt revolvers, or Colt percussion revolvers, but they are pretty cool. They're in the early version. Uh, just about the best one from this auction, or the highest priced one, was the, the version here, the third model with a shoulder stock. You know what? That's that's pretty cool. Uh, is it $12,500 cool to me? Well, no, I'm not the one who bid that, but uh, it's a rare variation. It's a cool gun. This doesn't surprise me all that much uh, for this gun. Now, moving to a couple of the earlier versions, well, one of the earlier versions, we have a second model that is the rarest version of the Dragoon, but we're not talking a huge amount of difference um, between the first, second, and third. It, you know, it, it's a lot of subtle details. Here you'll notice the difference in the rounded versus squared trigger guard. So 
$8,600 will get you a scarce second pattern, second model Dragoon. The third model here failed to sell, so that means it didn't hit its reserve, but I have no way of knowing what that was. Now, a first model Dragoon, a little more common than the seconds, actually. Exact same price, $8,600. And then the big one here is the Walker. They only made 1,100 Walkers. These, those, these things bring tremendous amounts of money, like $1,035,000, which to me is mind-blowing. Uh, I would not spend that myself. Apparently someone did. Uh, I hope they enjoy that gun. Um, we'll move on to the Cummings Dot Trainer. 2100 is, I don't know, perhaps a bit high for this, uh, but they don't, th this is one of those things that they don't show up very often. There, This probably went to someone who had a particular interest in, uh, say, training rifles like this. Um, and so when you get into very scarce items, you get a couple people who want a gun and that can really drive the price up. Now, if you're looking for mechanically interesting and historically significant, you know, relevant names, kind of early guns, uh, an 1835 Dreyse would be a pretty cool one. Uh, and went this one actually relatively low, I think, 1600 for 200 year old pistol, revolving, uh, or a needle fire pistol with a revolving breech, that's pretty cool. Um, Duck's Foot is one of those sorts of examples of classic old school firearms curiosa. Uh, you know, these are, are talked about a lot, but they don't actually show up all that often. And so someone who wanted to add one of these to his collection dropped $11,000 on it, just about. So again, kind of a neat piece. This is, this is one that I think the price goes up because they get a lot of publicity. Uh, as compared to something like a Shine Todd, uh, which Granted, this one was not in very good shape. It had been nickeled, maybe by the original maker, maybe not. Grips aren't in that great of a condition. Um, it is kind of big and imposing looking, but it brought less than a thousand bucks, eight hundred and sixty-three dollars, with the buyer's premium on it. So uh, that's a little more in line, I think, for where it should be. Now, an HK4 is not a four thousand dollar pistol. However, this particular one was in the original case and had the accessory case of all of the caliber conversions, all the manuals, all the magazines, and you really see a, you, you'll pay a premium to get all of it in really good shape as one complete package. And that's what happened here. So this is several times what just a, a standalone HK4 pistol will bring, but that's what happens. Um, the HK41 is kind of one of these other incremental variations on the G3. Uh, this is a 1974 gun, obviously, as you can see in the on the receiver there. And between the, during the, the 60s, 70s, 80s, HK had a number of different variations of semi-auto rifle that came into the US. So the first ones bring big, big money. These bring pretty decent money. You know, $33,000 $3, is nothing to sneer at. Uh, the SSG82 is a prime example of a gun that if you wanted it, you should have bought it when they were first imported because they were pretty cheap compared to this. And then they all sell out. And then you go back a couple years later and go, hey, you know that weird East German 545 bolt action? I'd like one of those. And now you have to pay $3,500 for one because that's how it works. Uh, this Luger has no real, uh, no, no real distinguishing characteristics to it except its serial number, which happens to show that it was one of the guns used by the Swedish military trials uh, just before World War II. So to the right collector, I think that's a really cool gun. To almost anybody else, it's just another Luger, and the price kind of came in the middle between those two. Uh, SPAS 15 is a gun that's fairly commonly available in some parts of Europe, um, but they weren't imported into the US because of the assault weapons ban, and by the time the ban went away, uh, Franke, well, the SPAS 15 was out of production, so today there are very few of them over here, and you're going to have to pay, at least in this particular auction, about five grand to get one. It is a pretty cool gun, though. Uh, the Vindicator, uh, 3000 for a, in this case, semi-auto belt-fed 22. Uh, this is a gun for someone who wants a fun range toy and has a fair amount of disposable income to drop on it. Uh, interestingly, little side note, apparently the entire Lakeside company is currently up for sale on Gunbroker. So if you have a couple million dollars, you might want to check that out. You can buy the whole factory. Uh, this Lindsay musket was in fantastic condition, although I am told that uh, a, a lot of them are, actually. I think a lot of these went into a government warehouse and never really saw use. 
Uh, but it's a super cool version of a, a pretty scarce Civil War two-shot uh, musket. So they're neat. Um, 3700 doesn't surprise me at all, especially given its condition. The Barnikov went high because it is a basically one-of-a-kind gun. This is a very unu mechanically unusual example of a basically a patent prototype sort of rifle that went into the trials uh, for what was eventually adopted as the Trapdoor Springfield uh, in the U.S. This is this cool toggle-locking open bolt single shot weird thing, and it's a, a one-of-a-kind gun. So 6,000 doesn't really surprise me. Um, a Marston three-barrel Derringer, mechanically neat, uh, $1,600 eh, maybe? Um, this is one of those things where if it's what you're looking for and it's in an advertised auction properly described, it's going to bring a lot of money. But it's also the sort of thing that you might just find at an antique show for $100 because people think it's just some junky old gun. I had two men's Lilliputs in here, um, a four and a quarter millimeter and a 25 ACP. The 4.25 brought more money, $4,300. Both of these were in really quite nice condition. They're both relatively uncommon guns to find. That's what drove the price up. Um, condition, when you get up uh, above 90% condition, the price really starts to escalate uh, a lot more than it does low in, lower in the condition range. So um, on the other hand, the Nichols and Childs was a, a pretty mediocre condition gun, a lot of wear on it, uh, but it's a very scarce example of a neat genre. Uh, an early percussion revolving rifle. There are not a ton of those around, and uh, there are some people out there who think they're pretty cool, like me. I didn't buy this one, but uh, they're cool guns. So lastly, we have the Percy prototype. At three grand, I think this went. I don't know who bought it. I definitely wouldn't have spent 3000 on this. As far as I can tell, this is a rifle that really didn't go anywhere and was pretty crudely made, but it is a neat, uh, it, it's interesting. Um, Clearly it was $3,000 interesting to someone. Uh, once again, I will say with all good intention, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, not what I would have spent three grand on, but hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. I uh, enjoyed getting a chance to take a look at some of these final prices. Stay tuned and we'll be back uh, with another cycle of auction videos shortly.